Today we'll be reviewing the assessment of the eyes. Let's first look at the external anatomy. We can see that there is a bony orbital cavity surrounded by fat, which is protecting the eye. For each eye, their eyelids are two movable shades that protect the eye from injury. They can open and they can close to also allow protection from light and dust. If you notice, the upper eyelid is larger and more mobile than the lower eyelid. The eyelashes are short hairs and they are distributed in double or triple rows. They curve outward from the lid margin and they filter out dust as well as dirt. The polybral fissures, these are structures of the eye that form elliptical open spaces between each eyelid. So the polybral fissures are from the upper eyelid to the lower eyelid. When your eyes are closed, your lid margins should approximate completely. What that means is that when you are closing your eyes, your upper eyelids and your lower eyelids are touching one another and you should not be able to see um, the polybral fissure open at all. When your eyes are open, the upper lid covers part of the iris. So you don't see white above the iris and you don't see white below the iris. That lower lid margin at the limbus, which is the border between the cornea and the sclera, you can see should be well delineated. There shouldn't be any of the whites covering over the iris or the colored part of your eye. So that's the limbal margin or the limbus. The canthus is the corner of the eye, and this is the angle where both of your lids are going to meet. So we call that the medial canthus, located closer to the nose, and then we have the lateral canthus, which on the lateral area of your face. In that inner canthus, though, you do have a caruncle, which is that small fleshy, it looks like it is rounded, and it contains a sebaceous gland. The sclera itself, this is a thick white sheath. It's very tough, and its structure is there to protect the inner parts of the eye. And most people know this as the white of the eye. That's a sclera. Don't confuse that with the conjunctiva, which is a very thin transparent membrane, and it spreads across the sclera. It covers the eye, and it keeps it moist and clear. It secretes small amounts of mucus and tears. The cornea, this is another transparent layer, but this is a layer of the skin, and it's spread over the pupil and the iris only. That's the cornea. And the main role of the cornea is to refract light, which helps us to see. The iris is the colored layer of tissue or the pigmented layer, and it makes up what is the colored portion of your patient's eye. Its primary function is to control the size of the pupil, depending on the amount of light that enters within it. So when a strong beams of light radiate into the pupil, it will start to constrict. When it darkens or the room darkens, it will start to dilate. Now, it functions as a diaphragm, burying the opening at its center, which is the pupil. It's able to constrict, controlling the amount of light that's admitted into the retina. And it's also able to to dilate to allow more light uh, to help you to better see. And then we have muscle fibers of the iris that contract the pupil. And it also allows for accommodation for near vision. And like we said earlier, it dilates the pupil when light is dim and for far vision as well. And then of course, the pupil is that small opening located in the middle of the iris, 
allowing that light to come in. We're going to take a closer look at the internal anatomy and there's the layers of the sclera and the conjunctiva that separate the external and internal anatomy. Remembering the conjunctiva is that transparent protective covering of your eye, but you also have the polybral conjunctiva. The polybral conjunctiva specifically, these are the um, areas of conjunctiva that lines the eyelids. It's clear and you can see many small blood vessels. In the bulbar conjunctiva, it overlies the eyeball and it's overlying not only the eyeball with white sclera showing through, at the limbus, the conjunctiva merge with the cornea. Now the cornea covers and protects the iris and the pupil we know. The cornea is very sensitive to touch and if you touch it just with like a wisp of cotton, it's going to stimulate a blink reflex. And this is called the corneal reflex. The trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve 5 also carries afferent sensation into the brain and facial nerve. Cranial nerve 7 carries efferent messages that stimulate this blink reflex. Your lacrimal gland is the inner, upper, outer corner over your eye. And this is where tears are secreted. Tears will wash across the eyeball and draw up evenly as your lid blinks. Tears drain into the lacrimal puncti on upper and lower lids at the inner canthus, and they drain into the nasal lacrimal sac, which is about a half inch long, and it empties into the inferior meatus inside the nose. Your sclera, which again is a tough protective white covering, should be transparent over the cornea, covering the iris and the pupil. You have then the choroid or the choroid plexus. And this has a dark pigmentation and it prevents light from reflecting internally and is heavy vascularized to deliver blood to the retina. You can see that with the pupil, the stimulation of the parasympathetic branch through cranial nerve three causes that constriction of pupil stimulation. So again, it's cranial nerve three that is causing constriction of the pupil. The lens is a biconvex disc and is located just posterior to that pupil. It's also transparent and it refracts um, light and it keeps a viewed object in focus on the retina. And the thickness of the lens is controlled by the ciliary body. The lens bulges focusing on near objects and then it flattens out when it's trying to focus on objects that are far away. So in terms of the internal structures of the eye, specifically you have the lens, the retina, you have the optic nerve, which is located at the end of the eyes behind the retina. And the optic nerve is mainly responsible for carrying all the nerve impulses from the photoreceptors to the brain. And without it, you wouldn't be able to see. Then we have the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor is watery just like the name suggests, and it presents in the area between the lens and the cornea. It is responsible for the nourishment of both the lens and the cornea, where the vitreous humor, which is a semi-solid, transparent, jelly-like substance, it covers the interior portion of the eye. And its role is to maintain the shape of the eye. It causes a refraction of light before it reaches the retina. Now we're looking behind and still within the internal anatomy, you can see that following that red reflex that will be triggered once light is refracted onto the eye wall, you can see that um, behind that is the optic disc where you see the veins, the arteries, the fovea and the macula of the internal eye. Now, you can only see these retinal structures through the ophthalmoscope. And in our class today, we won't be using the ophthalmoscope, 
but it is important to understand what structures are being looked at when a provider is using an ophthalmoscope. We mainly will be using a pen light for our purposes. Now, with the ophthalmoscope, you're seeing first the optic disc, and this is the area where the fibers from the retina are converging, and they're forming the optic nerve. It's going to be located toward the nasal side or the medial side of the retina, and there's three characteristics you're looking for. The color should vary from a creamy yellow to an orangish pink, and it should be a round or oval shape, and the margin should be very distinct and demarcated, especially on the temporal side. You'll also see a physiologic cup, which is the smaller circular area inside the disc, and um, it is where blood vessels are coming into and exiting from. The retinal vessels normally should include uh, paired arteries and veins that extend to each quadrant. Your macula is located on the temporal side of the fundus of the eye. And it is slightly darker pigmented region you can see over here in the temporal area. And it's surrounding the fovea centralis, which is the sharpest and keenest uh, vision center. And it receives and transduces light from the center of the visual field. Now, when light rays are refracted through this transparent area or the cornea, the aqueous humor, lens, vitreous body um, are all going to strike the retina through this centered area. Now, we still need to understand a little bit about how the retina transforms light, which stimulates into the nerve impulses, which is conducted at this visual cortex. So your image is formed on the retina, upside down and reversed. And this is gonna make more sense when we look at the optic chiasm, um, which are fibers from both the visual fields that cross over. And the left optic tract has fibers from the left half of the retina and the right optic tract contains fibers only from the right. So the right side of the brain looks at the left side of the world. We have six muscles that attach to each of our two eyeballs and it attaches the eyeball to its orbit and it's going to direct the eye to different areas depending on what your patient is looking at. They also are responsible for giving um, the structure to allow eye movement for the, it to be straight or to allow for rotary movement so that you can move around just the eyeball looking at the different corners of vision. We have four straight or rectus muscles these are called the superior, inferior, lateral, and medial rectus muscles. We have two slanting or oblique muscles, which are superior and inferior muscles. Each muscle should be coordinated. We have to think about the parallel axis. And this is important because the human brain has binocular single image visual systems, which means that both eyes are looking at the same time and focusing on objects. They don't have their own separate ability to see simultaneously different things, but the single image should be what both eyes are focusing on. Now the movement of the extraocular muscles are stimulated by three cranial nerves. It's important to remember that we have cranial nerve three, four, and six innervating the eye. So with cranial nerve three, this is the oculomotor nerve and it innervates the superior, inferior, medial, rectus, and inferior oblique muscles. Cranial nerve four, the trochlear nerve, innervates the superior oblique muscles only. And cranial nerve six, the abducens nerve, innervates the lateral rectus muscles, which abducts the eye. And I love this schematic here because it really does tell you 
the direction of each of the um, cranial nerves and which muscles are responsible for which field of vision. So just really quickly, the visual pathway. Um, I will not test you extensively on this, but again, this is just showing you that it is the right side of the eye fields that are speaking to the left side of the brain and vice versa. And because of this crossing of fibers at the optic nerve or the optic chiasm, we are able to see, and this is what gives the visual fields the ability to um, produce an image. Now, let's say you had a patient that had a lesion or disruption in this area of the optic chiasm, then this schematic here shows you what part of the eye, the dark parts are the eye, uh, areas of the eye that would not be able to see. So then this person here would only have central vision. On both eyes, you would only be able to see in the medial side of the eye. If for whatever reason, it was along the optic nerve here um, in A, then this patient would have left anopia, meaning that their left eye would not be able to see anything, but their right eye would not have a defect, and so on and so forth. Uh, using the schematic, you can um, see the areas of the visual pathway that are being affected. We're going to start talking about the reflexes. The first one that you want to be familiar with is the pupillary light reflex. And this is when we shine a bright light in the eye and we have both a direct and a consensual reflex. If you're shining the light on the left eye, that's your direct reflex of constriction. However, when you shine the light again on the left eye, you're gonna look the second time on the right eye because that eye should also constrict to that light reflex. This is the consensual. They do this constriction together. So when one eye is exposed to bright light, the other eye should do the same thing and constrict simultaneously. With fixation, this is a reflex direction of eye toward an object. And whatever you're looking at or whatever is attracting your attention, your eye should be able to fix on it in the center of visual field. And what allows this from, uh, to happen is this rapid ocular movement, putting the target back on the fovea and then Somewhat, there's going to be slower movements to track and target and keep the image within the fovea so that you can see. So what can cause these ocular movements of fixation to be impaired? These very rapid ocular movements can be impaired by drugs, alcohol, fatigue, and when you're not being attentive to a, spe a specific object. And lastly, on this slide is accommodation. And this is the adaptation for near vision of your eyes. So it's the accommodation for near vision. And so how do you do this? Your eyeball is able to accommodate by increasing the curvature of the lens through the ciliary muscle movement. And though you can't actually observe the lens itself doing this, you are observing it by the convergence of the axis of the eyeballs through pupillary constriction. Convergence means the motion toward the axis. And we'll talk about more specifically how to elicit this accommodation, but this is where you have someone fixate on something far away and then move an object closer to their face and have them fixate on that and they're uh, pupil should go from dilation to constriction with accommodation. Now moving on to developmental and cultural care. In terms of developmental care, uh, it's very important to understand 
the term presbyopia. Okay, presbyopia is the loss of your vision as you get older. And unfortunately, this loss of your vision starts around 40 years old. Cataracts is a cloudy white film that starts to cover over and it causes your, lin your lens to become more opaque over time. But it can be surgically corrected to remove that portion of cataracts. However, with glaucoma, this is something that can't be fixed. It's often related to diabetes and just getting older in general. And it has to do with the increased intraocular pressure of the eye. Macular degeneration is also associated to diabetic patients. And the, with the breakdown of the cells in the macula, it makes it more difficult to see. We talk about a newborn. They have peripheral vision, which is intact. However, the macula, which is the area of your um, eye fundus that provides the keenest vision, it's still absent at birth. And it's not until your infant is about eight months that you can actually um, note that the baby is able to see with more clarity. However, by three to four months, the infant will start to have the binocularity and they can fixate on a single image with both of their eyes simultaneously. It's not until then that they don't see without the image being very blurred. And the next slide will show you what that might look like for the infant. Other things that you want to consider with cross-cultural care is that there are some racial variations. Um, our patients that are white will have more uh, risk for macular degeneration. Our patients that are black have a higher risk for cataracts and glaucoma. Um, Hispanics have also a higher risk for glaucoma. And Asian patients will typically have more narrowed polyvoral fissures than our other patients. This slide here will review in a little bit more detail visually what um, presbyopia, cataracts, macular degeneration, and of course, what uh, the visual fields look like for an infant. And of these pictures, I really like this image showing what a newborn sees and then at four months, and as their macula area matures, what they're able to see by seven and 12 months of age. So again, it does take about eight months before that macula can mature and you can see with um, more clarity. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the subjective data and we're getting health history information during our interview with our patients. If this is a focus exam, or if it is a general exam, really you're gonna ask, does the patient have any difficulty with their vision? Is there any pain or strain of the eyes? You're looking and asking for strabismus and dipopia. Strabismus is when you have one eye that is slightly deviated from the other, and you can see variations of strabismus here and what they're called, you can see if you have an eye that deviates medially, this is called esotropia versus laterally exotropia. You have hypertropia when it deviates upward and hypotropia when it deviates downward. So these are descriptions of strabismus. Diplopia means double vision. You're gonna ask about redness, swelling. If your patient has allergies, they may have consistently um, watery eyes. You might ask for discharge. Uh, someone with conjunctivitis may have lots of crust and um, sticky discharge. It can range from a yellow to a green type of discharge. 
you are going to ask if they have a history of ocular problems like glaucoma or perhaps do they use glasses or contact lenses and then what their self-care behaviors are. In terms of self-care behaviors, things that I'm thinking about are, you know, if they do use their contact lenses, do they sleep with their contact lenses on? Um, if they do wear glasses or were prescribed a pair of glasses, are they actually wearing them? How often? And when was their prescription last checked? And if it continues to be changed, I might ask about um, the use of sunglasses protecting their eyeballs from UV rays as well. Something I also ask about or try to listen for in the health history is if the patient has any type of flashing lights. Whenever someone says, I have had just this um, unexpected pain and I see flashing lights and spots, I am concerned because this can be a sign of retinal detachment and this is a medical emergency. Any spots or floaters and flashing lights in your vision. Answer number two, your eyes feeling tired all the time. This is still a concern that you want to check into and ask more questions about, but it's not a medical emergency. Most often it's just an indication that maybe they need a, um, a referral to get their eyes checked and they possibly may need corrective lenses. My eyes get watery in a, when they're gardering, gardening, excuse me. This is not a medical emergency. Watery eyes in this case is most likely going to be attributed to environmental allergies. And then number four, I have trouble seeing and driving at night. This can also um, just be a um, still an area of concern, but not a medical emergency. When you have trouble seeing at night, this could be due to cataracts or simply a vitamin A deficiency. Still not a medical emergency. So the answer here is um, the first one. I see flashing lights and spots. Some subjective history that you might want to ask in terms of taking care of infants and children. Um, when your child is born um, through the vaginal canal, there could be an introduction of um, bacteria or yeast. And this is why we actually give babies um, antibacterial um, or antibiotic eye drops. And it's because we are protecting their eyes. Think about the developmental milestones of vision that we talked about earlier, noting that the macula does not form and is not mature until about eight months of age. And as the child gets older, perhaps school age, you do want to start doing routine vision testing, and this is going to happen in their primary care um, visits, but also in their school as well. And you do want to talk about safety measures, you know, what your patients are doing to protect their eyes, or in this case, their caregivers, what are they doing? And so you're thinking about what types of toys they're playing with, um, protecting them from different traumas that may um, be dangerous to their eye. So sharp objects should be something that is um, kept away from children. For our aging adults, we know that the visual difficulty starts at about 40 years old, and if you remember, that term is called presbyopia. But also you're checking to see, you know, when was the last time they've had a comprehensive vision exam? Especially if they've had a history of diabetes, they need to have a comprehensive visual vision exam at least once a year, and you're trying to get a baseline. Um, but also things that your patient might see, because they might not know they have uh, cataracts, you might ask, you know, it, does it look like things are becoming more difficult to see, like if you're looking through a frosty window or a window that's fogging up? And this is the main symptom of blurry vision that can be seen in cataracts. With glaucoma, that nerve that's connecting the eye to the brain is damaged. 
and it's due to high intraocular pressure most often. And these patients um, usually do not have any symptoms other than very slow vision loss. Um, older patients, because your mucous membranes start to dry out, as we age, they may complain of eye dryness, but also there are medications like anticholinergic drugs that can cause dryness of the mucous membranes, especially in the eyes as well. I also like to ask about their activities. This does give me a good indication of what might be changing with their vision. I will ask simply, you know, if they've noticed any visual difficulty when they're climbing stairs, when they're driving, when they're doing their chores, and has there been an increase in night vision um, difficulty as well. Now we're moving on to the objective exam or the objective data, which is the physical exam. And we want to make sure that we are testing not only near vision, but also uh, bar vision as well. And I position the, the patient standing for their visual screening usually before the entire exam, but it's okay if you do it at the end as well. So things that you might need are your Snellen, which is the larger chart, and then the Rosenbaum is the smaller chart. It's the handheld chart that is uh, used about 14 inches in front of the patient. If you have an opaque card or a cluter, you can use that as well. It looks like an eye spatula, but most often we just ask our patient to use one hand and cover their eye. You'll use the pen light um, to be a comprehensive eye exam. In some cases with advanced providers, they'll use an ophthalmoscope and an applicator stick, but again, we will simply be only using a pen light for this examination. So, the first thing we're going to do is check for central visual acuity. Okay, so it's not just important to understand what you're doing and how you're doing it, but what are the names of these tests? So the central visual acuity is tested by the Snellen and the Rosenbaum. Using the Snellen chart, you are putting your patient 20 feet away from that Snellen chart and asking them to read the line that, the smallest line that's they are able to read. And if they're able to read that well, then you go down. And if they can't read that very well, then you are going to move up on the Snellen chart. Normal vision is 20-20, which means that at 20 feet, the patient can read what most people with normal vision can read at 20 feet. If it was 20-30, that means that the patient, which you did not move, is still standing at 20 feet. But because they need to read the row that's a little bit bigger, what it's saying is that at that 20 feet, your patient is able to read what a person with great perfect vision can actually read at 30 feet. So their vision is less than normal. If it was 20 over 15, this means that their vision is greater than normal. The, your patient at 20 feet can read the line lower than the 2020 line and smaller, which means that at 20 feet, your patient can read what someone with normal vision could read at 15 feet. So the larger the denominator, the worse your vision gets. So 20, 30, 20, 40, 20, 50, it's all getting worse. The Rosenbaum tests for near vision, and this is at 14 inches. So instead of 20, 20, we use 14 over 14. And again, with patient dealing with presbyopia, that loss of near vision uh, continues to worsen at about 40 years old and older, which is normal part of aging. And uh, you would test presbyopia with the Rosenbaum chart. Now the visual fields test, also called the confrontation test, is testing your visual fields. It's saying, you know, at different angles of your visual field can you see and another way to say this is your purple vision so you have your 
the patient occlude one eye, you can use just the palm or you can use an index card if you have it or an opaque occluder. And you're moving your finger at different fields of vision and asking them if they can see your finger within that field. So that's a confrontation test. To check for extraocular muscle function, there are three different tests that you can use. The first one is the corneal light reflex, also called the Hirschberg test. I refer to it only as the corneal light reflex. And this is when you are shining your pen light at the corneas. And I usually do this about 12 inches away shining it at the bridge of the nose. And what I'm looking for is that reflection of light on the cornea. A normal exam would show that this reflection of light is in exactly the same spot on each eye. The cover test allows me to see if the eye is able to keep its gaze in a steady state and there's no movement or strabismus or pulling of that eye to one side or the other. And this test really detects small degrees of deviation alignment. When you have both eyes looking at an object, you have one eye, um, if it's weak, the other eye will try to compensate. So by closing or covering one eye, it interrupts this fusion reflex that normally keeps these two eyes parallel. So you're going to ask your patient to stare straight ahead at your nose and then you're looking to see what happens with that gaze as you cover one eye. So the normal response here should be a steady fixed gaze even when only one eye is open. Now if there is any type of muscle weakness that covered eye will start to drift into a relaxed position and so now you uncover the eye and observe for movement to see if it moves back in alignment when you take the card off the person's face or tell them to open the other eye. What you should see is that that stare should be straight ahead and steady. Still, they should be looking at your nose. Now, if you see this jump and it's reestablishing that fixation or this jump or meaning movement of the eyeball, then you note that eye muscle weakness does exist with your patient. And then you're going to do the same thing on the other eye as well. Again, noting that if someone has atropia, this is a misalignment of the two eyes when the patient is looking with both eyes uncovered. If the patient has aphoria, this is a latent deviation, which means that you're only going to see that with binocular viewing or with both eyes are um, able to see and it's being disrupted. What you'll note is that your eyes are not looking at the same object. And then lastly, we have the diagnostic positions test. And this sometimes has other names like the six cardinal gazes as well. And what you're trying to do is elicit your muscle movement. And by doing this, you can see if there's any muscle weakness. You're going to ask the person, to, again, to hold their head very steady and they're not moving their neck at all. And they're going to follow the movement of your finger or you can ask them to follow the movement of your pen light with only their eyeballs and not moving their neck. You're trying to be about 12 inches away so the person can focus comfortably and also to see if they're moving to each of these six positions. And so some people like to make the motion of an H, what, allowing your patient to follow your finger as you're making that H sign. Or um, what I like to do is the bike spoke where I start from the middle and I progress clockwise and I move my finger to um, about um, a one to two o'clock position, a three o'clock position, um, I move to a four or five o'clock position and then go to the other side and I move to about a seven, eight position, nine o'clock position, and then 
a 10 or 11 o'clock position. So six carnal gazes means six different positions of the eye. Again, you are trying to track and look for this normal response. Parallel tracking of your finger with both eyes. So in addition to that parallel movement, when you are checking with the diagnostic physicians test or the six carnal gazes, you might be able to notice some nystagmus. Nystagmus is a fine oscillating movement that is seen around the iris. Mild nystagmus um, at extreme lateral gazes, meaning like if you move your finger all the way lateral, um, this is normal. But in other positions, there should not be that much strain and there should not be oscillating movement of the eye. You're going to inspect the external ocular structure. So you're inspecting just generally what the eye region looks like. You'll be examining the eyebrows of your patient, making sure they're evenly distributed, your eyelids and your lashes, and making sure that the eyelids look the same on both sides as well as the eyelashes. Again, we're looking for symmetry. We're gonna look at the eyeballs itself, the conjunctiva and the sclera, making sure that there's no discharge. You're looking for any redness. Um, you're looking at the tear ducts, at the lacrimal ducts specifically, making sure that there's no clogged ducts um, and that there is no discharge. I tend to begin with the external points and I work inward, um, but whatever your method is, you wanna to try to keep it the same each time so that you don't forget to look at a particular structure. You're also going to look at the anterior eyeball structures. You're inspecting the cornea and the lens and you are looking at the iris and the pupil. When you're looking at the iris and the pupil, you are looking for equal size and shape. It should be round and regular and equal size in both eyes. What is regular size in an adult is about three to five millimeters resting size. But sometimes a, a person may have pupils that are different sizes. And this is called anisocoria, which is an important term that I do want you to know for the exam. And only 5% of people will have pupils that at resting are different and they start at different sizes. They both will still be able to constrict and dilate, but one will just start off a little bit larger or smaller than the other. So, when you are testing the iris and the cornea, after you look just at the size and the shape, you're looking at the pupillary light reflex. And the pupillary light reflex, what you're doing is darkening the room a little bit, and then you're asking the person to look at the distance. When they look far away in the distance, your eyes have to work a little bit harder. Therefore, the pupils are going to dilate. Now, if you turn on the light, then your patient's eyes should start to constrict because the eyes are shining through the lens now. And um, they are, the, the lens is refracting to control the amount of light in the eye. And then lastly, you're going to check for accommodation. Accommodation, you're asking the patient to focus on something in the distance and with this, because they're looking far, you're waiting for that dilation. So really wait to see the dilation happening. Then you're gonna have the patient shift their gaze to a near object. And by that, I mean, put your finger about eight inches, uh, excuse me, um, eight centimeters, which is three inches from the nose. And what you should see normally is that now as they move their gaze from something far, which was causing dilation of the pupil to something closer, which now is causing constriction of the pupil. You're seeing that there is a convergence of the axis of the eyes. So that is the accommodation from far vision to near vision. 
Let's practice. The nurse is assessing the pupils of a patient with a pen light. Which finding would be considered normal? Well, one is incorrect because you would be assessing ocular movements. Number two is incorrect because this finding is consistent with brain damage. Whenever your pupils are fixed and dilated, they don't respond to light at all, there's no constriction. That is a sign that there's something um, wrong with the neurologic pathway. And three is incorrect because this is indicative of maybe someone that is under the influence of a narcotic when both your pupils are dilating instead of constricting to light. So the answer here is four. Both your pupils should constrict in response to light. Remember that direct and consensual constriction to light. The answer is four. Now I'm just going to talk briefly about the thomoscope and the fundal exam, in which we call it. And we use a thomoscope to check for the red reflex. That red reflex is just a quick glimmer of red or pink that you might see as you're shining the light on the patient's eye and you have your eye in the ophthalmoscope, your own eye in the ophthalmoscope and you're looking. And this is when the room is darkened and it's best used when you dilate the patient's eye. And when you find that red reflex, you can follow it in and get closer to the patient and you start about 10 inches away from the patient at a 15 degree angle and then you follow that red glow and eventually you should be able to see the inner retina and you're starting to lose that red reflex but now you're able to adjust and see the ocular fundus where the optic disc is located the retinal vessels and you're looking just at the macula and structures as well now this is something that is done with advanced technique, so you should look forward to doing this more um, in advanced health assessment. So you will not be tested on this for our purposes. When you are performing the physical exam of an infant, you have to think about some of the uh, deficits that will come with just being an infant, meaning that, again, taking into consideration that their macula does not mature until about eight months old, so they would not have the visual acuity of um, an older child or an adult. But you would still check the external eye structures, lids, lashes, conjunctiva, and sclera. For an older child, you might use a spelling chart with uh, pictures if they're not able to tell you their alphabet yet um, but you can also use the tumbling e chart which shows the letter e in different positions and you're asking your patient to point what direction that e is point um, directed to so that you can see their visual acuity and still with an infant or a child they should have a red reflex this is something that everyone should have from birth and is part of the infant visual exam. Um, asymmetry also in the corneal light reflex may occur up until about six months, but after that it is abnormal. So the infant should be referred to a pediatric ophthalmologist at this time. Things to consider though, if, you're, if the baby was just born um, due to the transient edema of the eyelids from birth trauma, you may not be able to see these structures right away. So keep that in mind, but over time with the resolution of this edema, you should be able to see those external structures just like you would in a child or an older adult. By about age six or seven, you're also, in addition to checking the visual fields of your patient, um, you are going to start to assess for color blindness using the Shahara chart which many of you probably have received this in, as part of your physical first school. For our aging adult, we are concerned about visual acuity. We're still performing the same exam that we did 
uh, when we talked about just adults in general. But note that central acuity starts to decrease about after 70 years old. And in addition to that central vision acuity, the peripheral vision may also be diminished. In terms of ocular structures, you might see uh, coarser hair of the eyebrows. However, because you have decreased hair follicles, they may be dispersed and not evenly distributed. The eyes may appear to be more sunken in because you start to become a little bit more atrophied in that orbital fat. And you might also see that there is going to be dry eyes and less tear production because that lacrimal apparatus really is slowing down in that production. It causes the eye to look very dry. And your patient might even say that it feels like it's burning a little bit. Um, Pinguecula, this is commonly seen on the sclera of older adults. They are yellowish little nodules or elevated. And it's because the bulbar conjunctiva is thickening and there has been exposure to sun, wind, and dust over time. Usually you're gonna see them in about the three o'clock and the nine o'clock positions of the eyeball. If you're examining the cornea, it may look a little bit more cloudy as you get older. Arcus sinalis is commonly seen around the cornea, which they're gray-white arcs or circles around the limbal areas. And this has to do with uh, the deposition of lipid material. And so as more lipid accumulates, you might see that this corneal area becomes more thickened and raised. But this arcus sinalis should not change or affect your vision. Synthalysema is a yellow plaque. It's soft and it's raised. And you might see it in the um, lids at the inner canthus, and this is where it's more commonly seen. And about 50, 60 years old, you're going to see it more frequently also in women, and you're going to see it bilaterally normally, so both eyes. And this can be a sign that your patient has high cholesterol. It doesn't diagnose high cholesterol, but it could be something that you might see. Also, when you get older, pupils. Uh, start to become a little bit more smaller. The pupillary light reflex in general is slowed down a little bit, but should still be intact. Uh, the lens loses some of that transparency and starts to look more opaque. And if this patient had an ocular fundal exam, it would have less shine. The blood vessels would just look more paler, narrower. Um, you might see that there will be drusen which is degenerative hyaline deposits, which are benign, and they usually will form over the retinal surface. So in general, a comprehensive eye exam will include a Snellen eye visual acuity test, as well as maybe a Rosenbaum test for near vision. Uh, you will check the visual fields by the confrontation test. You're inspecting the extraocular movements or muscle movements by conducting the corneal light reflex cover test, diagnostic position tests, examining both the external eye structures and also the interior eyeball structures. And if they are being seen by an advanced clinician, which you will not be doing today, is that ocular fundal exam with the ophthalmoscope. So please just use your pen light for the other examinations. You're charting today if your patient had healthy vision. Uh, subjective, you can say the vision is good with no recent change, no eye pain, no inflammation, no discharge, no lesions. Your patient wears corrective lenses or does not wear corrective lenses. The vision was last tested a year ago prior to arrival, and test for glaucoma at the time was normal. So you are going to change that uh, to whatever your patient today tells you or your partner in lab. For the objective test, to chart the Snellen test, you use OD, which means ocular dextra or right eye, 2020 or whatever that is for your Snellen chart findings. And then ocular sinistra OS is the left eye, 2020. Fields are normal by confrontation, corneal light reflex symmetric bilaterally, diagnostic position test shows 
EOM's intact, the brows and lashes are present with no ptosis. Ptosis means drooping of the eyelid. Conjunctiva is clear, sclera is white, no lesions, and perla. Pupils are equal, round, reactive to light, and accommodation. Today you could omit the fundal exam charting because you will not be using the optomoscope. The slides moving forward are showing some abnormal findings, so I'm going to go ahead and have you look through. And it correlates with your textbook, uh, strabismus, esotropia, exotropia, and what paralysis of the pupils may look like. You're also going to look for abnormal findings of the eyelids, paying attention closely to uh, periorbital edema, um, exothalamus is the protruding eyes, endothalamus is sunken eyes. Um, just a quick uh, comment about exothalamus. The protruding eyes is something that you see with hyperthyroidism a lot. We talked about ptosis, which is a drooping of the upper lid. And you're looking for any changes in polyvalent slant, as well as ectropian and entropian. Some other abnormal findings of the eyelids. Blepharitis is inflammation of the eyelid. Sometimes this gets inflamed. Um, if you're sharing makeup or using makeup that is old, you might have blepharitis. Um, chalazion, this is where you have chronic inflammation from a blocked gland versus a hordulum, sometimes called a sty. This is an infection of the glands of the eyelid also. Um, and you'll see redness and it tends to be very tender, where chalazion is non-tender. Uh, dacrocystitis, using dacrocystitis. This is inflammation of the lacrimal sac or the tear sac. But dacroadenitis is inflammation of the lacrimal gland or the tear gland. Itself. In the pupils, again, I told you I want you to remember what anisocoria is. This is unequal pupil size at rest. So um, both uh, pupils should be relatively the same size normally, but 5% of adults will have unequal pupil size. You can see here that there's some abnormal findings of the external eye. That first picture on top with the yellow discharge, this is showing some conjunctivitis. Uh, the next slide is showing a subconjunctival hemorrhage. And um, iritis is just when you have circumcorneal redness and um, irritation. So that last picture there is showing some um, iritis. Atrigium is when part of um, your eye uh, iris is covered with this benign growth here. As long as it doesn't cover the pupil, it's not going to change your vision. This is um, a pretty common finding also. Um, a hyphema is when you have pulling your collection of blood inside the anterior chamber. Um, and you can see that this picture here is showing hyphema. Um, which is different from hypopian. This is where the inflammatory cells in the anterior chamber of the eye are being seen. And you're going to have a leukocytic exudate, so white blood cells, you're going to see more whites in the chambers. Um, if you have a corneal abrasion, you may have to um, put a fluorescein stain over the eye, which causes a yellowing of the eye, but it will pronounce the location of the corneal abrasion. These are some examples of cataracts. The first one is central gray opacity, and then we have the star-shaped opacity under that, which is coral uh, cataracts. This is more for advanced information, but I do want you to note that on a fundal exam, if there's any disc pallor, then, uh, so I'm thinking, you know, pallor meaning the color of the optic disc, uh, that that can be a sign of optic atrophy. If you have uh, papilla edema, those areas of your fundal exam will look a little bit different. You might see some disc hyperemia, optic disc swelling with blurred margins, and you'll see the veins here will be very engorged. 
excessive cup to disc ratio is also a finding that is abnormal. Um, usually it should only cover seven tenths of the disc with a ratio of 0.7 would be considered excessive because, excuse me, normally it should be 0.3. So that optic disc should be small in comparison. Do you see this optic disc here? It's very big. You see the hyperemia, um, which it is showing a larger disc ratio. Um, however, this cupping by itself is not indicative of glaucoma, but a larger cup to disc ratio can show possible glaucoma, but there's other pathologies that should be eliminated as well. Arterial venous nicking, or what we call AV nicking, this is where when we examine, the small artery is crossing the small vein of the eye. And when we see this, it will result in the compression of veins with bulging on either side of that crossing. When we see this, it is very telling of diabetic retinopathy.